I'm Tom Tate, and this is the Power Time Podcast. Hey, what's up, Power Players? Tom Tate here. I am your host and guide. We are back for episode number three of the Power Time Podcast. For those just tuning in for the first time, the Power Time Podcast is an exploration through the history of Nintendo, one issue of Nintendo Power at a time. Today, we are going to rev up the old DeLorean and we are going to time travel back to November, December of 1988 to check out issue number three of Nintendo Power Magazine. So, Nintendo Power Magazine, still $3.50 on the shelf, still the source for NES players straight from the pros. And this cover is an interesting one. We have two sneakers that are not connected to any legs uh, running on a track, and these sneakers look very futuristic. They have little rockets uh, coming out of the heels. Um, So whoever's going to be donning these sneakers are going to be seriously playing with power. Uh, the cover story for issue number three of Nintendo Power Magazine was, of course, Track and Field 2, the sequel to Track and Field. Uh, 16 explosive events uh, tear up the track. So I'm excited to check out the feature on Track and Field 2. Very, very strange cover. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what I think should have been on the cover for this particular issue. Uh, but we'll get into that in just a bit. Also, we have Captain Nintendo video superhero fiction feature i'm excited to see what that's all about uh certainly uh probably a callback to captain n which was a cartoon that i don't believe uh was on the air at the time of this publication uh but this might be a precursor so we will check that out out, check that out as well and we also have more blaster master plus a fold out poster Uh, nintendo always always promoting their fold out posters And we have a gigantic holiday giveaway. So if you were a child, a Nintendo playing child in 1988, you no doubt had Nintendo titles on your Christmas list or your holiday list this year. Uh, So you would certainly be interested in this gigantic holiday giveaway uh, and really begging mom to uh, pick up this issue of Nintendo Power off the shelves uh, so that you can enter. So a little light... Uh, on the cover stories, if you ask me, uh, we have one featured game, Track and Field 2, uh, which I guess was exciting back then. I don't have too many memories playing it. Uh, Captain Nintendo, not too sure what that is, uh, just based on the cover. And uh, more Blaster Master, which of course was an amazing game, uh, but was covered briefly in the previous issue. So we'll, we'll get, into, uh, get into this issue again. It, it, it feels a little light. Uh, but let's let's keep going. Let's keep going. I, I I would hate to think that Nintendo lost their steam after just three issues of Nintendo Power. Uh, so hopefully we can we can have some redemption uh, as we move through. Okay, so opening up the cover of issue three, uh, we have an ad for customer service tips on everything from how to hook up your NES to what to do when your dog chews up your game packs. Uh, And there's also a light ad in here for the game counselors. So I was kind of curious reading this ad uh, if people were getting confused between basic help desk uh, Nintendo uh, hotline and the game counselors hotline. So it it seems like the game counselors hotline, which was advertised in Nintendo Power in the past, uh, was really for tips, tricks to help you master the games, uh, get, get past certain levels, beat certain bosses. Uh, and and they charged you for that, for calling in. And we talked about that being referenced in the film, The Wizard. But here we have, you know, make a power call. And this particular ad is plugging customer service. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was an issue that Nintendo ran into where people were crossing their wires and calling the wrong hotline. So next we have the welcome letter from the editor. Uh, which I, I, I would assume was Howard Phillips at the time. It's not signed off, 
Uh, but this welcome note expresses excitement for the holidays. Of course, Nintendo would be excited for the holidays. 1988, Nintendo was certainly peaking uh, in terms of being a craze, at least here in the U.S. Uh, so there was plenty of merch and plenty of titles to sell. Uh, there's some talk of Track and Field 2. Uh, two RPG reviews are teased in the welcome note, uh, not mentioned on the cover, but we'll check those out. And uh, there's some mention here of some of the other uh, pieces of content in the issue, but we're just going to jump right into it. And I also noticed here the official seal of Nintendo, uh, which starts to show up on all of their their main uh, first party products. Uh, and, and that seal absolutely goes a long way uh, in, in future marketing for Nintendo being that, that you know official seal of quality. So issue three gets right into the cover story with Track and Field 2 on page six. Track and Field was, of course, released by Konami in 1988. It was a direct sequel to Track and Field, which was originally an arcade title. Uh, and just going through the, you know, the first image in the spread, uh, we have 15 world-class events, all of the excitement of the Olympics. We have fencing, triple jump, swimming, high dive, shooting, hammer throw, horizontal bar, hurdles, archery, pole vault, taekwondo, and more. And this was certainly inspired by the 1988 Olympics in South Korea, which was happening at the time of this release, or I guess shortly after, uh, or shortly before the release of this title. Um, I had con actually confused tr the track and field series with world-class track meet, which used the power pads. So my cousin had a copy of World Class Track Meet with the Power Pad, and we spent hours and hours and hours playing that title, cheating the Power Pad. So the one memory I have of the Power Pad was you could kind of like, for long jump, you could run and then just jump off the Power Pad. And if you were quick enough, you can jump back on the Power Pad. You would be able to successfully do uh, a very impressive long jump, uh, simulate it without actually jumping up in the air. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And I had thought, you know, looking at this cover uh, initially that we were going to be learning about the power pad and learning about World Class Track Meet, but I had my games mixed up. So this is actually a completely different title than that. Um, I'm hoping that we cover the power pad in, in a future episode because I had so much fun with that. Uh, and it was such an interesting uh, peripheral at the time, uh, just such an in interesting product uh, that somebody at Nintendo R&D decided would, would sell well. Uh, and, and to me, it really showed that even in the early days, Nintendo was interested in getting people active and moving uh, and really combining entertainment experiences with activity. And while so many people spent countless hours glued to the TV uh, with their butts on the couch playing Nintendo, uh, the intent was certainly there, in my opinion, uh, to really get people moving. So... Hopefully, we will talk about the power pad in the future, but right now, let's talk about track and field too. Uh, so this game had three modes, training mode, practice mode, and Olympic mode. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote directly from Nintendo Power because I absolutely love this. Konami Airlines jets you to the Olympic Games in a special 747 landing just in time for the opening ceremonies. So I thought that was pretty hilarious, you know, and they actually have a screenshot here of an airplane. Uh, so you really do get on a, a Konami branded airplane and fly to the Olympic Games, uh, which is which is pretty cool. And then with your free time, you can have fun with the exhibitions uh, in between your qualifying rounds. So this was password based. So you would you would do the qualifying rounds and then apparently you would get a password, um, which is certainly helpful. So you don't have to sit here. Uh, and leave your NES on overnight to save your progress, uh, which I absolutely remember doing for some games. So there's also a versus mode, and this is very, very interesting to me. Uh, the versus mode included, 
apparently included three different events, arm wrestling, fencing, and taekwondo. So fencing and taekwondo absolutely makes sense in the Olympic Games, but I don't remember arm wrestling being an official Olympic game. So maybe this was like a back alley uh, type of event that you would do uh, in between uh, qualifying rounds and exhibitions. Uh, you would just challenge other athletes to arm wrestling. Uh, so I thought that that was a really interesting inclusion. The screenshots look cool. The screenshots uh, definitely make it look like it was a fun little event. I checked out some YouTube videos uh, for track and field too, um, but I never actually played the game. So if anybody out there has any strong opinions on track and field too, uh, you can you can tweet to me at Yo Power Time on Twitter and let me know how you feel about track and field too. I will definitely get back to you. I will retweet it. Uh, but let's have a conversation about track and field too because I am uh, uninitiated. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to listen to another tune from Track and Field, uh, and then we'll get back and talk about the coverage of Track and Field 2 in Nintendo Power. So the issue then goes directly into strategy, providing full page tactics for fencing, triple jump, freestyle swimming, high dive, clay pigeon shooting, hammer throw, taekwondo, pole vault, canoeing, archery, hurdles, and horizontal bars. So, you know, most of the events are covered here and that's a whole lot of strategy. So we actually see an image of the NES gamepad, uh, the controller on each of these with kind of a diagram of what the A button does, what the B button does, how the D-pad interacts with both. Um, And then you have tips on how to uh, really excel in these specific events. Uh, Here's a quote from Wikipedia that I found really interesting about track and field too. A common problem players had with the game was that many of the events required a power meter to be built up by rapidly pressing the A button, then releasing it with the B button. Many players could not press the A button fast enough to build up enough power, though it could be done with a turbo controller or using a method similar to stringing a a guitar by holding the controller against the player's chest or a flat surface and using the thumb and index finger together, running them rapidly across the A button. So it's amazing uh, to think about the things that people did to successfully compete in these titles Uh, even things that were painful or required you to do weird stuff like emulate stringing a guitar. And this totally reminded me of when Mario Party 1 uh, was released on the N64. So if any of our listeners remember uh, when that title was released on N64, there were these mini games where you had to rotate the joystick. And in order to do so, you had to rotate it so quickly to win. Um, You really honestly had to do it so fast. I I can't even imagine um, that testers thought that this was a good idea. So people would use the palm of their hand uh, to do it. You know, they would rest the controller on the ground for leverage and they would use the palm of their hand to kind of rotate in a circle. Um, And not only would they ruin their joysticks, you would kind of get that white powdery residue all over your joysticks uh, from the friction. Uh, But you would get these huge blisters in their palms. It was absolutely crazy. Uh, I would honestly play and I would have friends that would play until your palms bled uh, or you would lose skin uh, because of how fast and how vigorously you had to rotate your controllers. So I found that quote uh, certainly interesting on on Wikipedia and definitely, you know, it goes to show that this type of uh, controller shenanigans have been going on for so long. So we're going to wrap up track and field two here. Absolutely. You know, there's more research I could have done. There's more that could have been said. Um, again, I did not play track and field two growing up. 
I did not retroactively go back and play it. Now, if any listeners want to have a conversation about it, definitely tweet at me at Yo Power Time. Uh, but I believe that there is another game featured in this issue that should have been the cover story, and we'll be talking about that in just a minute. But first, I want to share with you how you can get involved with the Power Time community, how you can support the show, uh, and really how you can just uh, get in touch with myself and get in touch with like-minded Nintendo fans out there uh, so that we can keep on reminiscing in between episodes how amazing uh, the Nintendo eras have been uh, throughout our lives. So we'll be right back after that. So I want to quickly share just a few different ways that you can support the show if you're enjoying it so far. The first way, probably the easiest way, is just to subscribe through your favorite podcast app so that you can keep coming back, keep listening, and keep giving me feedback so I can improve the show. If you are enjoying the show, uh, another way that you can support is to leave a review on iTunes. Uh, That definitely helps me attract more listeners, but also if you leave me feedback, uh, that will also help me improve the show as well. And finally, if you are absolutely enjoying the Power Time Podcast and you know that you are a super nerd just like me, And this is the absolute uh, best outlet for you uh, to get your retro Nintendo fix. Check out Power Time Unlocked at powertimepodcast.com slash unlocked. Join the community, make some new friends, and then go tell all your current friends uh, and we'll have fun. Next up, we got a couple pages on Mickey Mouse Capade. So Mickey Mouse Capade was a blast. Uh, I had so much fun with this challenging little platformer. It was very, very difficult. Uh, I remember this very well. Uh, it was one of the first Disney titles. Uh, I believe it might have been the first Disney title that was released uh, on the NES. And of course, I was a big Disney fan back in the day. Uh, so I was excited to pick up a copy of this. Uh, It was developed by Hudson Soft, who developed games like Hudson's Adventure Island and uh, Mylon's Secret Castle. But it was actually published by Capcom, and this is huge uh, historically. So Capcom uh, in the NES and Super Nintendo days uh, were probably uh, short, you know, next to Nintendo, my absolute favorite developer uh, during this time period mostly because of the Mega Man and Mega Man X uh, series, which are my absolute favorite games uh, growing up still to this day, Uh, but also because of some of the incredible games that they made uh, in partnership with Disney. So they had the license to a lot of the Disney shows and characters. So this game, uh, Mickey Mouse Capade, it wasn't Capcom developed, but it was definitely the start of something great. Uh, And we'll be talking about a lot of those future games like DuckTales, Tailspin, uh, and then later, you know, uh, Disney's Aladdin, uh, which is so amazing. So uh, Mickey's Magical Quest, the list goes on and on. uh, And we'll be covering all those for sure. Uh, But here we have, you know, just some strategy for Mickey Mouse Capade. After that, uh, we have two full pages of Howard and Nestor. Uh, Howard and Nestor are back with another comic strip. Uh, In this case, Howard shows up Nestor once again as Nestor tries to impress his friends with Castlevania two-tips. And, you know, leave it to Howard Phillips uh, to definitely make Nestor look silly in front of his friends. And Nestor did not appreciate that one bit. So uh, we're going to take another quick break uh, just to check out some music from one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, And then we're going to talk about the game that I believe should have been featured on the cover of issue three of Nintendo Power.
So the next big feature in this issue is Blaster Master. And here's a direct quote from Nintendo Power. Jason loved his pet frog, Fred, more than anything. One day, while playing Leap Human, Fred suddenly hopped away. By the time Jason caught up, Fred had jumped into a, onto a box of leaking plutonium, which had fallen from a truck. Although the box was marked dangerous, Fred, being a rather careless frog, had not read the warning. Instantly, the radiation made Fred grow larger than any frog in history. In shame, he jumped down a hole into the foul world of mutants, and courageously, Jason followed. Over the next few pages, uh, we get a lot of background and game maps to help you get through Blaster Master's first two stages. There were eight stages, according to Nintendo Power, and there's a page that outlines how the stages were weaved together. So if you played through Blaster Master, you'll know that the, the levels in Blaster Master weren't entirely linear. Um, you could sort of you know backtrack, and you had to kind of progress in, in a zigzag sort of way. And there's a map here that shows you how everything was interconnected. So I'm really, really surprised that Blaster Master didn't get the feature spot in this issue. Uh, I guess I'm not totally surprised. If this was around the time of the Summer Olympics. Uh, I'm sure Nintendo Power, from a marketing standpoint, was trying to show variety with uh, with the sports cover. Um, so you know, we had some some action adventure covers in the past with Mario and Castlevania 2. We will have action adventure covers in the future uh, coming up with Zelda and Ninja Gaiden or Ninja Gaiden. Uh, so it, I guess it makes sense to, to mix in some sports. But uh, because we didn't go so deep into track and field 2 in this episode of the podcast, I'm going to give uh, just some background on Blaster Master by Sunsoft uh, because I think it's, it's historically just a great NES title, not just the music and the graphics, uh, but the gameplay, I mean, this is just such a fun game to play. Uh, and it certainly set the stage for a lot of uh, top-down games that would be released in the future, uh, which we will talk about, of course, in future episodes as well, kind of beckoning back to Blaster Master. So this game was originally developed in Japan under the roughly translated name Super Planetary War Records Meta Fight. It was released in November of 1988, uh, and Blaster Master introduced two styles of gameplay. We had the 2D platforming, uh, but then we also had this top-down perspective. And the top-down mechanics remind me a little bit of TMNT, so the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where you can drive around in the party van, but you can also hop out, walk around on foot, uh, though being on foot was always way more dangerous than if you were just in the van. So. That whole mechanic and TMNT was released uh, after uh, after Blaster Master, and we'll talk about that because it does get a cover issue of Nintendo Power in the future. Uh, but Blaster Master also had, as I mentioned, this non-linear style to it. So you return to previous levels to advance to new areas. And the top-down dynamic later inspired a lot of Sunsoft games. So we have Gremlins 2 and Fester's Quest, uh, Two games that are based on movie licenses, uh, Gremlins, of course, Gremlins, and then Fester's Quest based on the Addams Family, uh, took a lot of learnings from this top-down dynamic, and you'll see that gameplay uh, referenced there as well. So Blaster Master was created by Yoshiaki Awada. Again, I apologize for all Japanese names. My my Japanese pronunciation is terrible. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to push my way through uh the music and graphics in this game they were absolutely top notch for a 1988 title in fact uh iwata is quoted in saying the goal was really to try to pull off the best graphics on the nes to date simple graphics were more or less uh the standard on the nes at the time but i had this firm belief that it was possible to do something better something prettier I feel like we pulled it off and we were able to show people that it could be done on the NES, what could be done on the NES. 
And I would agree with that. Uh, I think, you know, the intro to Blaster Master looks really, really good. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to find a video and link up a YouTube video in the show notes of the intro video because I think it's worth watching. Uh, it really set the tone and, the you know, the set the stage for, for the game and, and really pushed uh, graphically uh, the, the NES specifically uh, in a way that other games will reference in the future. Overall reception for the game was super positive. Mostly reviewers praised the unique game styles uh, and the merging of multiple gameplay mechanics. So as I mentioned, you know, we had top down driving in, in this armored vehicle. You can get out, walk around. Uh, but then there was also uh, like a 2D side scrolling element too. Uh, the exploration aspect is certainly referenced in a lot of reviews as well. You know, the nonlinear nature of the game was praised. Uh, but the biggest issue that reviewers had was the difficulty. So there are no passwords in Blaster Master and there's no ability to save your progress. So you had to finish the game in one sitting. Or as I mentioned earlier in the episode, you had to leave the NES on for long periods of time. And I, I definitely remember doing this myself and I remember other people doing it. Uh, it wasn't totally uncommon, uh, but I'm curious you know, what that did in terms of power consumption and, and just... Uh, the general health of your your console. So the level of challenge getting all the way to the boss with no continues in one sitting was part of the NES experience. Uh, you know, I, I definitely believe that. You know, it was really the challenge of these games were you had limited amount of lives. Most games uh, really early on had no password system. Uh, and that was part of the experience, you know, getting all the way to the boss. Uh, but the absolute greatest frustration in any Nintendo game is getting to the boss with low health and maybe one or zero lives left uh, in a game that didn't have passwords, uh, limited continues, and dying at the boss because uh, it was just so much wasted time. Uh, but again, you know, this was the NES experience as I remember it. Games were difficult. They were meant to be difficult. And uh, that was part of the allure. So here's some more music from Blaster Master, this time from legendary NES tribute band, The Advantage. So I'll, I'll just give a quick reflection on Blaster Master and then we'll keep moving with the issue. I, for one, played a lot of Blaster Master. This was definitely a title that I rented a lot. I don't think I owned a copy, but I remember the the uh, cover art on the cart. Uh, and I absolutely remember renting this game a ton. I don't think I ever owned it, but, you know, I borrowed it frequently from friends and neighbors. And this was definitely in constant rotation uh, with the rest of my titles. Uh, Blaster Master itself left a pretty decent legacy. So it yielded a Worlds of Power novel, which was, uh, and, and we'll probably talk about this too in future episodes, it was a series of NES-inspired kids' books published by Scholastic. And I had a couple of these. They were so much fun. Uh, and an interesting fact about those was they were actually started by, you know, one of my marketing gurus, uh, Seth Godin, somebody whose blog I read quite frequently just to learn about business and marketing. Uh, in my professional life. Uh, so I was, I was really, really excited to see that he was the original uh, ideator of the Worlds of Power novels. Uh, and Blaster Master received a couple sequels. So there was a direct sequel on Genesis. There was one being developed for the Super Nintendo, but it never actually was released. And a couple of Game Boy games came out uh, and then a PlayStation title. But if you really want to play Blaster Master, I recommend playing it uh, in, its, in its original incarnation. If you want to check it out in 2016 or beyond, you can pick up a copy on the Wii Virtual Console or the 3DS Virtual Console. So it's easy to get a hold of. Uh, I'm thinking about doing it myself. There's also Blaster Master Overdrive, which was released as a WiiWare downloadable title in 2010. So this was a reimagining of the original NES title. It's not quite... Uh, a, a remake story-wise um, or level design-wise, but it's just a reimagining, borrowing a lot of the same elements from the first title. 
We also have, you know, kind of built in here a powerful gift ideas ad, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but before we get there, uh, there is a beautiful Blaster Master pullout map uh, and poster featured in issue number three of Nintendo Power, which I wish I had hanging up in my office right now. So as I mentioned, uh, there is a whole section dedicated to powerful gift ideas. So we are looking at the Nintendo Power issue that was released right before the holidays in 1988. Nintendo merchandising was certainly on the rise, uh, and there are a whole lot of interesting products that are being featured here. I'm going to share a few with you now. Um, we have a control deck carrier, uh, which was basically just like a little nylon zip-up bag for you to put your NES when you wanted to travel with it. Uh, anticipation for NES, uh, which was a, a game uh, based on anticipation. Nintendo athletic wear. So we have these little uh, Super Mario track, track suits, which look pretty cool, certainly fitting for the track and field issue of Nintendo Power. Game Pack Organizer, we have a slumber bag, not a sleeping bag, but a Mario 2 slumber bag. Uh, Super Mario Lunchbox, we have Remote Controller, which was a wireless NES uh, controller. Nintendo Baseball Caps, we have a Game Pack Carrier, so if you want to travel with your Game Pack, your, your uh, Game Packs, you could do it. Uh, Nintendo Pajamas, Super Mario Bedding which I think I had, not the ones that are featured in this issue, but I certainly had Nintendo betting at some point. Uh, we have Roll and Rocker, which looks like some type of floor-based controller that I don't recall. Uh, Nintendo Beach Tail Towels, uh, Action Figures, a Mega Controller, uh, which is a third-party controller. We have Nintendo Underwear, so if you want some Super Mario Brothers undies, you can get them. Uh, if you really want to class it up, they have Nintendo suspenders, uh, Nintendo backpacks just to get ready for school, uh, Nintendo stickers, a Mario rain slicker. So if you want a red plastic uh, rain uh, jacket, you could definitely pick up a Mario rain slicker. And then uh, finally, we have Nintendo shirts, uh, a collection of shirts and pastel colored tank tops to show off your love of Nintendo titles. So up next, moving on, we have a section on RPGs. And the first uh, opening to this section is a question. What is an RPG? So we have to remember, uh, we're in the early days of, of, of console, you know, home-based console video games at the time. So, you know, genres like RPGs needed to be defined and explained to this new audience. Uh, so here we have an explanation of what an RPG is. We have some cool 80s fantasy art here, which uh, is super awesome. It's reminiscent of some of my favorite heavy metal album artwork uh, and, you know, some of the early fantasy novel uh, artwork that I grew up on. Uh, and the two games that are discussed in this issue are Ultima and Legacy, The Legacy of the Wizard. So Ultima is a traditional RPG from developer Richard Garriott. Uh, it, this NES title is actually a port of Ultima 3 Exodus, and it had a job system. You could choose from 11 occupations, cleric, fighter, barbarian, paladin, lark, etc. Uh, lots of RPG elements referenced here, you know, getting gold, buying items, upgrading weapons and armor. And there's actually a shifting of the moons, right? So time changes in the game affected gameplay. So up next, we have Legacy of the Wizard. I'm going to read this little blurb verbatim. Long ago, the inhabitants of a small village lived in the shadow of an evil dragon. One day, a wise old wizard from the north conjured up a spell that froze the dragon in a painting, which was buried deep in a dungeon. So after that, you know, there were years of peace, uh, but then... Uh, they sensed a reawakening, and that's where your journey begins. So we have this sleeping dragon that is about to re reawaken. So according to Wikipedia, Legacy of the Wizard is an installment in Falcom's Dragon Slayer series. And this is one of only three Dragon Slayer games that were actually localized outside of Japan. So the game was an early example of an open-world, non-linear action RPG that combined action RPG gameplay with what would later be called Metroidvania-style action-adventure elements. Uh, that's how we know it today. Uh, and it was based on Dragon Slayer 4. 
So this was actually released in 1989, April of 1989. So it'll be a while before uh, gamers actually play this game uh, that's being featured. So this is pretty awesome, but it includes a password feature. And that's definitely something that they highlighted in this issue. And they would have to continue to highlight uh, because games were so challenging and RPG specifically really needed access to those password features. So this looks like fun. I might have to check out Legacy of the Wizard at some point. I'm going to add it to my list. Uh, but moving on, we have Counselor's Corner. First up, we have Metal Gear. Uh, so Counselor's Corner is basically an FAQs where you can ask game counselors questions about your favorite games. The question about Metal Gear, how do, how do I earn stars? Uh, where is card seven? How do I get the rocket launcher and compass? How do I get through the maze zone? So all of these are answered. Uh, Rambo, how do I destroy the flying fortress? Uh, what I like here is uh, there's actually profiles of the anonymous agents. So Agent 684 became a game counselor February 1st, 1988. His hobbies include golf, computers, writing fiction, fantasy stories. His highest game score was in bases loaded. I love this. 36 to nothing. That was his highest game score in any game. Uh, he won in bases loaded 36 to nothing. And his favorite NES game is Side Pocket. So Double Dragon's in here. Gauntlet is also featured. So classified information is up next. Uh, again, classified information was top secret dev codes and cheats. So these were, you know, the, the codes that you had to input with the game pads, secret codes like the Konami code. Uh, featured in this issue, we have Gradius, Zanuck, Akari Warriors 2. We have Super Mario Brothers, and we have Deadly Towers. So next up in the issue, we have a full spread on the NES Advantage and the NES Max. Perfectly fitting right before the holidays. These were two very popular special controllers back in the day. And I remember I had the Max. Uh, so I actually had one of these. My neighbors had the Advantage. So the Advantage was a flat uh, controller uh, that you set on the table. It was huge. Um, or you can set it on the ground. Uh, and it had an arcade style joystick kind of protruding out of it. It had really big A and B buttons, uh, two turbo buttons, uh, and a slow button, which I believe just rapidly paused the game on and off to simulate uh, slow movement. Uh, so this was certainly to emulate kind of the arcade cabinet style joystick. And then there was the Max, which was a handheld wired controller uh, with, with curved edges. Uh, so it felt a little bit more comfortable in your hand uh, instead of the rectangular sharp edged NES controller that came out of the box. Uh, and I recall uh, having the Max specifically. Uh, it was wired. It had a circle pad instead of a D-pad. Uh, and this was actually called the Cycloid. I didn't know that it had a name. Uh, but the circle pad, uh, which is just a little nub, kind of reminds me of um, some of the handhelds that exist now. Uh, and it had two turbo buttons as well beneath the A and the B button. Uh, and they even list in this issue, the top five games that take advantage, uh, no pun intended, uh, take advantage of the joystick, the slow motion function, the turbo function, and the cycloid. So Nestor from Howard and Nestor uh, is featured here, and he's on hand in this particular ad to tell you how and when you should use these features. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, next up, we have Now Playing, uh, which we have a feature on anticipation, which is basically like an NES board game slash game show style title that was presented here uh, to be accessible for a wider audience. You know, so if you had family members that weren't really into gaming, this was supposed to be kind of the gateway game to, to get them into it. After that, we have Blades of Steel. Shing! And Blades of Steel was one of my favorite games. You could choose one of eight teams. Uh, no team names, just cities. Like you had the New York team, the Chicago team, et cetera. And uh, this was hockey. So if I didn't make that clear with my Blades of Steel uh, introduction, this was a hockey game. It was absolutely amazing. I spent a ton of time playing this as a kid. Uh, one of my favorite features as, as, as a kid growing up was the ability to fight uh, in Blades of Steel. And at that age, it was really exciting. Uh, you could just get into a brawl with another player. I think if you just knocked into him enough times, uh, you would throw the gloves off and you would go into this little uh, boxing segment. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, there wasn't much strategy. There was a lot of button mashing. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, one or both of you would end up in the penalty box. Uh, there was an exhibition mode, a tournament mode, a two-player mode. 
this was absolutely a fan favorite for sure. Blaze of Steel was just such an awesome game. Uh, and the music was great too. And I believe we actually featured some of the music uh, from Blaze of Steel in episode zero of Power Time Podcast, uh, just as the introduction to the show. So after that, we have Cobra Commando, which is a battle helicopter title, side-scroller uh, action-adventure where you can defeat enemies and save hostages. Racket Attack, a tennis title, 16 of the top pros in the world. Uh, see if you can net the number one spot. And up next, oh snap, let's do this. That's right, everyone. For video shorts, we have a pair of bubble-blowing dinosaurs in Bubble Bobble by Tato. Select Bub or Bob and plow through 113 stages. This is an incredible game, very challenging. Uh, hours and hours of fun playing this as a kid. Um, this was one of the first games that I also remember, uh, and I'll talk about a title in the next episode as well, uh, but... I have very few t titles in my in my history uh, that I, I physically remember my mom playing them frequently, uh, and this was one of them. Uh, so there was Bubble Bobble. Uh, up next, we have Paper Boy. Deliver the papes, avoiding manholes, grates, tornadoes, cars, and even the Grim Reaper, which was another game that I remember my mom actually playing. So uh, Bubble Bobble, Paper Boy, and again, another uh, game that we'll mention next episode. Uh, which is cool. Like I have these memories of my mom actually playing Nintendo uh, and she was never really into any future video games past the Nintendo era. So Super Nintendo N64, she didn't really get into any of those games. Uh, but as a kid, we would play uh, just a few titles and these were a few of them. Up next for video shorts, we have Ghostbusters by Activision based on the hit film. We have Tecmo Baseball, Challenge Pebble Beach, Dr. Chaos, Tecmo Bowl, Platoon by Sunsoft, based on the film as well. Milan's Secret Castle, which I'll predict we're going to touch on in a future episode. And after this, uh, we have Pack Watch. Pack Watch is one of my favorite sections. It was a crystal ball into future titles for Nintendo. We have a trio of football titles, NFL Football by LGN, John Elway's Quarterback by Trade West, and Touchdown Fever by SNK. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Bandai, a cool action adventure title. I remember renting this game often as well. We have WrestleMania by Acclaim, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Bam Bam Bigelow, Randy Savage, Honky Tonk Man, and Ted DiBiase all on board for WrestleMania. Hollywood Squares based on the TV show. Uh, the Power Pad uh, included in the power set, but around the corner, it'll be available on its own. So there you go, folks. We're going to uh, catch some information on the Power Pad at some point in the future. California Games and Skate or Die uh, are referenced here. Operation Wolf, Spy vs. Spy, and Spy vs. Spy, the Island Caper, also mentioned. Uh, and we have the NES Planner, which looks into the future November, December, January, February, and future releases. So notable games here, Marble Madness in January, Who Framed Roger Rabbit uh, in the future releases section. So some of my favorite games are still yet to come. Up next, we have Captain Nintendo. So here's part one of what appears to be a straight up short story about Nintendo uh, straight from Redmond, Washington, the home of Nintendo of America Incorporated. So characters in this story include Max Powers, Brett Randalls, and Tara Bates. And this reads to me like fan fiction, uh, but it, it's, it's actually really entertaining. Uh, and it feels like a precursor to one of my favorite cartoons, Captain N where a normal player, just like you or I, gets sucked into the TV uh, and gets to interact with his favorite Nintendo characters. Uh, so in short, 
I don't want to give away too much of the story here in case, of course, you want to track down issue three and read it yourself. Uh, but there is a freak accident at the Nintendo Research and Development Special Projects Department that gives Brett superpowers while also materializing Metroid's villain Mother Brain in the real world. So there's adventure and insanity that ensues after that. There's a cliffhanger at the end to get readers really pumped uh, for the shocking conclusion in the next issue. Uh, absolutely entertaining, you know, not just as a kid, but, you know, right now I read this uh, part one of this story and I thought it was really funny. Uh, super 80s. Um, it has all the right elements that you would expect from a late 80s video game inspired story. Uh, so uh, I, I like this. I actually like this better than the Howard and Nestor comics, uh, this type of you know short fiction, just to get people reading. So up next, we have the giant holiday giveaway, and this is just in time for the holidays. Issue number three's Players Poll ups the stakes with a giant giveaway. Over 600 winners promised, one grand prize trip for four to Disneyland, four days and three nights. Uh, so if you were a kid, you were absolutely all over sending in your postcard with the answers. Uh, to all of Nintendo's questions. Uh, you can get copies of hit titles. Uh, there's an NES Advantage uh, on the line here. And then uh, for the remaining 175 winners, a Mod Podge of titles that you could choose from. So you had options there. All you had to do was fill out a postcard letting Nintendo know a ton of information about you and your favorite games. So the most anticipated games, uh, what you'd like to see in Nintendo Power in the future, Again, I'll say this over and over again. This was just genius market research from Nintendo. Uh, really, really uh, fantastic market research. So they were able to collect all this information uh, from, their, their, from their readers. Um, just uh, really, really smart. After that, we have NES Journal, video game happenings around the world. We have a profile on Woo's, W-O-O-Z, a 12-acre amusement park in California. Uh, and this was an amusement park built around mazes. Uh, Lakewood, California, uh, they had their first annual RBI baseball tournament. I think this is hilarious, uh, and I, I think it would be really, really funny if, you know, in 2016, this was still going on, and I can go to Lakewood, California and check out, uh, which I guess would be the, the 28th uh, annual RBI baseball tournament, uh, which would be really cool to see. Uh, Dr. Powers 10 Telling Questions. Uh, this was a little quiz that you could take to see how big of a game uh, gaming fanatic you were. Uh, after that, we have a celebrity profile with comedian Jay Leno, who was then the Tonight Show guest host and Doritos commercial star. So that's what he was known for at the time. We first learned of his interest in the NES when he called asking for help on level seven of Zelda. This brought the game counselors a lot of smiles. They love getting calls from celebrities and yes, Jay did solve Zelda, both quests. There's not much to do in many small towns at 11.30 p.m. after that second show, says Jay. So I'd bring a Nintendo game with me on the road and play till three or four in the morning and then crash out. So fun little uh, profile here. I thought this was awesome just hearing from a celebrity like Jay Leno. Uh, very cool. Uh, and uh, it's, it's cool to know that adults, why well, I guess Jay was an adult back then, uh, were really into Nintendo. This wasn't just the kid's toy. And maybe this was, uh, maybe this was Nintendo Power's way of exposing that, hey, adults, celebrities like Jay Leno play Nintendo too. After that, we have the Invent the Ultimate Video Game Contest. Howard Phillips, the spokesperson for Nintendo of America uh, at the time, uh, he launches this competition to submit your own game idea. You can win a trip to DC, you can win a party for your class, bonds for college, etc. cetera. Uh, so someone somewhere, this amazes me, is probably sitting on a $3,000 bond from this contest, which is just awesome. Uh, so if you're curious, you know, to see if the winning game, I'm, I'm curious to see if the winning games get announced in future issues. Uh, we'll see. But, you know, I have to say, I really respect uh, and admire and appreciate these kinds of contests that Nintendo did in the early days, which encouraged gamers to think like game creators and really exercise their imaginations. Uh, again, really put themselves in the shoes of, of somebody who has the ability to create these worlds and create these adventures and create these experiences. Uh, really good work to Nintendo. Uh, but it's very, very possible, of course, uh, that all my ad admiration is for not if they were really just trying to get game ideas that they can execute on themselves. I doubt that that's the case, but of course it's always possible uh, with any big business. 
So after that, we have mailbox letters from the players. Uh, so I'm not going to read the entire letter, but there's a letter here from the Happy Hockey Club. And the, the letter is just absolutely bonkers. Uh, so somebody writes in, and I'll read just the very beginning uh, quickly, just to give you a sense of this group of uh, Nintendo fans. Dear Nintendo, hi, my brothers, my boyfriend, and I would like to thank you for creating ice hockey. The living room in our house has never been as crowded. What you are about to read is absolutely the honest to God truth of what we went through to get the game. So this group first heard about ice hockey while they were watching the Stanley Cup playoffs in a commercial. And they immediately had to acquire the game. So they called everywhere. They couldn't find it. They finally found it uh, at a toy store in Chicago. So they flew. They flew in an airplane. They got in an airplane and flew to Chicago. Uh, And then once they were in Chicago, they were able to acquire the game pack, but they were out of control decks. So they didn't have an NES to play on. So they were calling around to try to get an NES and they couldn't find one. Uh, until uh, the writer's boyfriend who plays uh, Junior League in Canada found one in Canada. And he said, I'll ship it to you. And they said, no, 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 no. We don't want to lose it in the mail. So they flew to Canada to pick it up directly. And then while they, while they were in Canada, uh, they stayed up all night playing it in the hotel. Uh, they were so loud in the hotel uh, that they were actually thrown out of the hotel. But they said, Who cares? We have our system. Um, So they could not be happier. So they went all around the United States and Canada to get the NES and the ice hockey game pack. And it cost them $2,249.82 when all is said and done. So they wrote this letter to Nintendo. And all Nintendo has to say in response is, you certainly went to great lengths to find that game. Another way to find a store that carries Nintendo products is to call our customer service department at 1-800-422-something-something-something. We'd be happy to help you. So I don't know if I believe this story or if it was just a ploy from Nintendo uh, to just plug their consumer service department, uh, but just very, very hilarious letter here in uh, mail mailbox, uh, which was a section that features letters from players. After that, we're going to wrap up this episode quickly. Uh, We have NES achievers, all the top scores uh, as sent in from players with photographic proof of those top scores. We have video spotlight where uh, players just like you or me um, share their own personal tips and tricks for games that they loved. And then after that, of course, we have the top 30. So every episode of the Power Time podcast, I will reveal uh, the top 10 of the top 30. I'm not going to go through all 30. Uh, again, the top 30 was uh, basically an aggregation of picks from the players, the pros, and uh, the I guess the retailers. Um, so they would create this point system uh, and just create an aggregation uh, between the players, the pros, and what they call the dealers. Uh, and that's how they got their top scores. Uh, so the top 10 for issue number three of Nintendo Power Magazine. At number one, we have The Legend of Zelda. At number two, we have Metroid. Number three, Metal Gear. Number four, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Number five, Gauntlet. Number six, Super Mario Brothers 2. Number seven is Bases Loaded. Number eight, we have Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. Number nine, Double Dragon. And number 10, we have Kid Icarus. So I thought this was pretty curious. Uh, No Simon's Quest. Uh, despite being the featured title in the previous issue. Uh, The players chose Double Dragon uh, as their number one pick. So the NES players out there love Double Dragon more than any other title uh, at this this time, Uh, but it shows up number nine in the overall. And uh, Nintendo Power actually references Metal Gear as the quick riser, uh, rising to the the top. Um, Certainly, it's number three. Overall, number three uh, in the pros picks and number two in the dealers picks. Uh, But it's quite low. Yeah, it's number 10 in the players picks. Uh, So you'll see some some variance there uh, between the players, the pros, and the dealers. 
So after that, we have coming up in the next issue, uh, which will be coming up in the next episode of the Power Time Podcast. We have Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. The moment you've been waiting so patiently for has finally arrived. Uh, We're going to be covering WrestleMania. And according to Nintendo Power, we will also be learning about RoboCop uh, based on the sci-fi action hit movie. The back cover of this issue, to close it out, uh, we have a picture of a Christmas ornament hanging from the tree. And in the reflection of the Christmas ornament are tons of Nintendo products. Uh, So once again, one final jab before the holiday season, just to remind readers uh, that Nintendo is is coming in strong for the 1988 holiday season with tons of titles uh, and even more accessories. All right, Power Players, that's going to wrap up today's episode of the Power Time Podcast. Thank you for sticking with us. This episode was longer than usual. Uh, We covered a little bit more of Blaster Master, despite also covering uh, the cover story, which was track and field too. I had to do it. I love Blaster Master, and it was exciting to learn a little bit more about the history there. Remember, if you want to get in touch with me, Uh, The best way to connect, uh, you can definitely start following us on Facebook, facebook.com slash power time podcast. It's a good page. You can follow us. You can post. Um, We have a private Facebook community. If you want to get in on the private Facebook community, just head on over to powertimepodcast.com slash unlocked. Uh, You can sign up there for free. Uh, You'll get a quick email with uh, information on how to access that group. Uh, We're having a ton of fun over there. Uh, you can tweet at me. Uh, my personal Twitter handle is at TNRT, or you can tweet at the show at Yo Power Time. Y O Power Time. Uh, those, those are the absolute best ways to get in touch with me, to keep in touch with the show. Uh, also, you can absolutely subscribe. Uh, the best way to subscribe is to subscribe through iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app. Uh, You can also leave us a review. Leaving a review really helps me continue to improve the show. Let me know what you like. Let me know what you don't like. It doesn't have to be a five-star review, but a positive review uh, with feedback just helps me continue to improve. Uh, And you can do that over at iTunes. The music that we listened to in today's episode is as follows. First, we heard the unofficial theme to the Power Time podcast that is Eat My Chips by Azure Flux. Then we heard a couple tracks from Track and Field 2 by Konami. After that, we heard a song from Mickey Mousecapade. After that, we heard My Sweet Sophia by Viking Guitar Productions, a super awesome rendition of some music from Blaster Master. After that, we heard from The Advantage. Uh, We heard Blaster Master Stage 2. And finally, we heard The Advantage, uh, the rendition of Bubble Bobble. So if you want to check out the music that was featured in this episode, just go to powertimepodcast.com slash three. Absolutely uh, check out some of the links that I have there so that you can support some of these artists. In fact, today, as I'm recording this, The Advantage actually just released a brand new live album that was recorded uh, 10 years ago. So they're still putting out new music. Uh, and they have some secrets up their sleeves, I believe. Uh, so definitely support these artists. They're doing amazing work, bringing back the music that we grew up that we grew up listening to. So that's going to wrap up today's episode of the Power Time Podcast. You can definitely tune in next week. We'll be back with issue slash episode number four. We're going to be covering The Legend of Zelda 2, the adventure of Link. It's going to be a blast. And until then, keep on playing with power. <laughs>